Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Down on my knees and I'm going to ask God to, to be our guidance today, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher today. So if you're able to stand as I get down on my knees and pray, would you stand as we prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord today? Father, we come before you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. God, we don't take it for granted that we have the freedom to worship, Lord. We don't take it for granted that we have the ability to come uh, several times during the week, 11 services here, Lord, to worship you, to, to seek after you. God, we don't come here for entertainment, for tradition, to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. We come into this place to hear from you. And Lord, we fully acknowledge that Jesus is the senior leader of this church. And so it's in the name of Jesus. We ask that your Holy Spirit, your precious Holy Spirit, would be our counselor today, would be our guidance, would be our teacher out of the word of the Lord. Show us the thoughts and the truths out of the, out of the word today that, that you have for us, Lord, that we would walk out of this place equipped to be your church, to shine your glory for your, uh, your, your kingdom's sake, Lord. And we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, Lord, we don't ask these blessings just upon ourselves, but upon all the brothers and sisters across the world in the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we at the church never think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but Lord, we are truly co-laborers. And so, Father, we thank you that for harvest and for the grove and for sandals. Lord, we thank you that you would set your hand upon the well and the way. Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia. Lord, we thank you for uh, Emmanuel Baptist, Trinity, Crossroads, New Living, uh, uh, New Life, uh, New Creation. Lord, we thank you for uh, Abundant Living. All the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world, too many to mention, Lord, our denominational brothers and sisters, those who are, who are affiliated with certain denominations. Lord, we thank you for all of them, Lord. Regardless of, Father, we thank you that if they believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Lord, believe that you rose from the dead, we thank you that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, preaching the gospel for your kingdom, for your glory. So, Father, we thank you that your hand would be upon them as well as on us today. Teach us your word that we might not forget it. In Jesus, we th give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said? Amen. Amen. Well, I think tonight's going to be a fun night. I think it's going to be an interesting night. I'm, I'm excited for what God's got in store. Now, I don't know what it is. Sunday, if you were here for uh, uh, the Sunday and Saturday messages, everybody afterwards, after the services, they're saying, man, Pastor Luke, you were just, you were just on it with movies. I, I was all these movie references coming just, I don't know. And, you know, I told everybody I was so bummed because uh, being, being the young adult person and, and growing up with the name Luke, I, I was forced into being a Star Wars fan. I, I, I had to. I, I, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, Luke, I am your father, I would, I would be richer than Bill Gates. And the one movie reference I did not make for the, for the geeks out there was Sunday was May the 4th Be With You. So, you know, some of you are like, Pastor Luke, seriously? No. All right. Anyways, on to another movie reference. Here we go. You guys remember back in the 90s, there was that combination of, of, of actor and actress that they, they were just... They were just on fire together, man. They made a couple of movies together, and it was all these, these love movies, men and women alike. Just enjoy. You remember Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan? Do you remember that Sleepless in Seattle? You remember? The, and then the, you've got mail, and, and, and they, were, they were just, they, just, there was chemistry together. And, and, and they were well known. They were just kind of like this dynamic duo. You were waiting for what, what kind of movie was going to come out next. I remember when I, when I was growing up, there was a movie that we would always watch that was less popular, but it was the, I think it was the first of their interaction together, and that was Joe versus the Volcano. Did, 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 did anybody ever, you probably, half of you probably are like, I never even heard of that movie. There's a reason why, okay? It was kind of a test. But Joe versus the Volcano is kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight. And the reason is, is Joe was a man in the movie. And, and there's so many movies, there's so many uh, stories, there's so many poems and so many books that are written to this same message. Joe was a man. He lived a mundane life. He worked in the, the way that they, they depicted it in the movie. He, he worked in a green fluorescent lit office building. Everybody wore, everybody wore the same color suit. You know, everybody, nobody stood out. Everybody blended in. There was, he came to work. He lived in a small apartment that was run down, that had nothing to do. He was bored. There was no, no motivation in life. It was mundane. It was boring. Why live? You think about that, there's movies all over the place. There's, there's analogies in, 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 in Hollywood and in, in society and all forms and fashion kind of points to this that there's got to be something to life more than just existing. There's got to be something to life more than just going to work, coming home, 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 watching your TV show, going to work, coming home. There's got to be something more to life. And so 
these movies point it. And in the movie, Joe Brothers Volcano, it was real interesting. There's, there's this island somewhere in the middle of the ocean, and the, the, these people believe that if, if somebody didn't jump in the volcano, that the island would sink into the ocean and everybody would die. So they were trying to figure out, well, who, who's going to jump into the volcano? Nobody wanted to jump into the volcano, so they decide, well, let's tell this guy, Joe, who's like the world's biggest loser, the most mundane person in the world, let's make up some kind of stupid disease and tell him that he's dying. So they tell this guy, Joe, you're dying. Your, your life's over. You're, gonna, you're not going to live three more weeks. You might as well do something good with your life and go jump in this volcano and save these people. And so, you know, Tom Hanks' his character says, well, why not? And so, you know, these, these guys say, well, we'll pay for everything. We'll pay for your journey out there, for the voyage. We'll, we'll buy you new clothes. We'll get you new luggage. We'll get you all. And so he goes on the shopping spree. I mean, he just buys everything he could buy. He buys the finest luggage that he could buy. I mean, he, he learns to do this, and he goes, and he, and he steps out of his comfort zone in these three weeks of his life because he thinks that there's no more reason to live. That if he didn't, if he didn't do it now, it's just like, like that movie, The Bucket List, right? There's the second, third, third reference today. We should keep a tally, Pastor Dan. If there's not a reason, that we don't do anything. And so what happens is we see this in society, and then the story goes on. He, he jumps, he finds, he finds love. Meg Ryan is the source of love, or the character of love. He finds love. They jump in the volcano together, but the volcano spits them out, and they find themselves in the ocean afloat, ready to die, and his luggage that he bought saves him, and, and the, the, the rest is happy. It's, it's a good, they, they lived happily ever after, except for the island sank into the ocean and everybody, I think. But anyways, that's irrelevant to the movie. But you see, oftentimes we get this image that there's got to be something more to life. There's got to be something more. There's got to be a reason. There's got to be something that we do in this life that for, for, for us to exist here, to, be, to get beyond the mundane, to go out of what we know, out of what we realize. And today I want to talk about the title of the message is Life Outside the Comfort Zone. Life Outside the Comfort Zone. And we're going to look at this out of the fulfillment of what God has for us. We're going to look at this relationship that we call Christianity and how it takes us outside of this little area that we call the comfort zone. Now, do any of you relate? Now, we're Americans, so most of us uh, would, would, would relate to this. But do any of you relate to the personal space thing? Do, do, do you have a personal space? Is anybody? Personal space? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be bold. Well, actually, I won't be bold because if you don't have a personal space issue, then you probably don't have a problem answering this. Does anybody not have a personal space issue? You know, a couple of you are like, yeah, man, I like getting up right up and close, man. I remember, you know, I, you always find out if you have a personal space issue if, when you're at an amusement park, you know, <laughs> because there's always that one person that's from another country where they're just used to it, man. They got a, a billion and a half people within, you know, one city. And you know, have you ever seen the videos of them trying to shove these people in the subways? They just don't care, right? So, you know, you always find out when you have a personal space issue. When you're standing in line and somebody who doesn't have a personal space issue is right next to you. I remember I was in line with some people with our young adults ministry, and there was a guy, man, he had no personal space. I mean, he was spooning us in line, standing there. I mean, and, and we, there was like five of us. And we, it was a long line. We were at Disneyland. It was a long line. And we took turns because it was so close. I mean, people, we were sweating, and we were like, all right, it's your turn, your rotation. Like, and we had one backpack. So we said, all right, whoever's in the back of the line, you get to wear the backpack and just kind of, you know, move it around. Kind of be like, hey, this is my person. It's our comfort zone. You don't, don't violate me in my comfort zone. This is, this is my space. This is your space, okay? You, we're okay as long as you stay there and, and, and I stay here. But you see, Christianity takes us out of our comfort zone by nature. From the very essence, from the very beginning, it, by faith, we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have to believe in the salvation. We have to believe that we are safe. And in that very essence right there, it takes us out of our comfort zone because faith, as the Bible tells in Hebrews, is the evidence of things unseen. It, 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 it's the fruit. It, 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 it's, it's the evidence, right? It's the substance. So we don't see it, but faith says it's there. And so because of that, we have not much to stand on but faith. So Christianity takes us out of our comfort zone, but living life out of our comfort zone is like Job. Those three weeks of, of his life where he thought he had nothing to lose. He thought he was, he, if he died now, what, no, what big deal? When we live life out of our comfort zone, when we stop worrying 
about the next day. When we stop worrying or stop thinking about our own selves, when we start to think about God and God's examples in our lives and God's direction in our lives, then all of a sudden life takes a change. Life takes a turn. It goes from just, well, I'm comfortable here in my bed. I'm comfortable here in my house. I'm comfortable with my few friends. I'm comfortable with my spouse. I'm comfortable at my job. And that's, that's all I will live for is these, these things. And, and it takes us out of this area. And it says, there are people in this world over here that need to hear. There are people in this world that God's desire, God's plan is for me to be a laborer that is sent out on their behalf, but I won't do that unless I step out away from my own comfort zone and into God's plan for my life. So I thought what we could do today is looking at life outside the comfort zone and looking at some of the illustrations and some of the actual examples that God gave us in the New Testament of his disciples, of his followers, where Jesus, in some, in some cases, literally kicked them out of their comfort zone, kicked them out of the nest, and, and forced them to learn and to see what happens after that. Has anybody ever taken a step, taken a step of faith, taken, taken a leap of faith, or, or, or you put yourself out there, you know, you've kind of gambled, and, and, and it paid off? And maybe, maybe let, me, let, me, let me take it there, because I don't want to say, talk about gambling. That's a whole different thing. So let me take it. Has anybody ever shared the love of God with somebody? You were nervous. You were sweating. And they said, yes. Has anybody ever experienced that before? Look at you guys. Praise God. Full-time ministers of the gospel. You know, for every 100 no's, that one yes makes all those go away. Right? And we realize that when we step out of our comfort zone and we see the reward, we see the payoff of that, it makes everything else fade away. And now all of a sudden there's a reason to live beyond work, beyond home, beyond favorite TV show, beyond just raising our kids and making sure that they stay alive. Now there is a purpose. There is fulfillment in our lives. And we've got to learn to step out of our comfort zone. So let's look at some examples today. Are you all right with that? And we'll take, we'll, we'll give you some points and we'll look at the examples based on those points. So life outside the comfort zone, life outside the comfort zone. We've got to learn to first thought tonight is to rely on God's provision, to rely on God's provision, God's provision. You see, God will provide. Thinking back to Matthew, the sixth chapter, remember that? We've talked about it so many times, 633. Don't seek the kingdom of God. Why do you worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat? He says, don't worry about things. If God will take care of the birds of the field, he'll take care of you. He says, seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus says, and all these things will be added unto you. So we have got to learn to rely, to trust, to put our faith in, to step out of our comfort zone and say, God, here I am out of myself, here I am out of my own element, and out of my personal space, I have been invaded by your Holy Spirit, and now my personal space is your personal space, and I will rely that you will provide. I will trust in you. We've got to learn to rely on God's provision. If you've got your Bibles with me, go, Bibles, go with me to the book of Luke, Luke in the ninth chapter. Go with me to the book of Luke, ninth chapter. If you've got your Bibles, turn there with me. Ruffle your pages so I can hear you turning, so that way I feel good that you brought your Bibles. There we go. All right, that sounds good. Now we're talking. Luke in the ninth chapter. We're going to read a couple verses. We're going to skip some segments, and we're going to read a couple verses, because we're going to look at the illustration, and we're going to look at the results. Stepping out of the comfort zone... And see what happens. In Luke, the ninth chapter, Jesus is sending his disciples out. And so it says in verse number nine, or verse number one of the ninth chapter, then he, Jesus, called his 12 disciples together. And he gave them, listen to this, this is very important. He gave them, so he called them together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So Jesus gathers his disciples together and he says, I have bestowed upon you, I have given you this ability, I have equipped you, empowered you to do this. Even though you have been empowered, you still have to take the action to do it. You see, you and I have been equipped by the Holy Spirit. You and I have been equipped by the power of God, by Jesus Christ, because he went on high and is now seated at the right hand of God, because it is finished. You and I have been given the authority. You and I have been given this power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but we have got to choose to step out of our comfort zone and use it and apply it, because it doesn't just say, it didn't just say that he called us 12 and he gave them the authority. All right, verse number 10, or chapter 10, right? There's a couple more verses after that. So he calls them and he gives them the authority, and he says, verse number 2, he sent them, 
He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now Jesus says, listen, I have given you the authority. Now it's time for you to apply it in life. So go. All right, praise God. That's us. That's Christianity 101. God's given us the authority. Now Jesus, the Great Commission, says go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? To teach and make disciples, baptizing them, right? So Jesus has given us that authority. Jesus has, has sent us out like his disciples. But look what he instructs his disciples to say. Jesus' own words. Verse number three. Take nothing for the journey. Neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics apiece. He gives them specific directions. Now, I can handle, as, as a human, as a person of faith, hey, Lord, praise God, you give me the power. Hallelujah, I love it. I got the power, right? All right? I got it. Cool. Jesus says, I'm going to send you out. Praise God, Lord, send me. Use me. And then he says to his disciples, you got the power. Get out there. Oh, don't take money. Don't take shoes. Don't take clothes. Don't take walking sticks. You have no plan, no map, no itinerary. Don't go on Hotels.com and book your place. You're just going to go. Okay, I got the power. I, I'm going to use it. But, 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 but where? Where am I? Don't worry about that. You just go. But, but who, whose house am I going to stay at? He says, don't worry about that. You go and you seek and you find out who's going to take you. And if they say no to you, then shake the dust off your feet. So he sends his disciples out with specific instructions. Just get rid of everything. Don't worry about it. I have got, he's giving them an object lesson, a specific instruction. Get out there with nothing but the clothes on your back and see what God does. He's kicking them out of their comfort zone. You see, they followed him. They watched him heal the sick. They watched him cast out the demons. They watched God provide for him. But now Jesus is saying, there's going to be a time when I'm not here, and if I don't do this, you will have to do this. And that's why he tells his disciples, greater things that you will do in my name, because I am sending you out of your comfort zone to learn to trust in God's provision. So they go out. He goes on to tell them, whoever hears you, Bless them. If they don't, don't worry about it. You move on. Verse number six says, They departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Praise God. They applied it. They departed. They said, all right, Jesus, at your command, we'll do it. You say go, we'll go. So they go with faith, trusting that God will provide. No food, no money, not two tunics. Or and You and I would describe that as not two change of clothes, so one, one for each day. I mean, you're going to get stinky after a while. And they say, but nevertheless, we'll go. And so Jesus sends them, and they go, and they depart, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, I love this. Verse number 10 skips down. Verse number 10 skips down, and it says, And the apostles, meanwhile, uh, we're talking that John the Baptist has been beheaded, and Herod's kind of wondering what's going on. Now verse number 10 says, And the apostles, when they had returned, told them all that they had done. See, they went out. Well, but, but, but you gave us the authority. Okay, I got that. You, you gave us the power. Okay, you're sending us. But wait, no money? No, no clothes? No itinerant, no plan, no, no plane ticket, no gas in the, in, in the tank. W what are we going to do? But they went out. They trusted in God, and God provided. And now they come back. Jesus, you're not going to believe this. The demons were subject to us, and we even saw them flee. I mean, we walked, and we healed people. And Jesus is like, I know. I know, but, but, but no, we prayed for people, and, they, and they, they were healed. And we saw people who had demons, and they ran. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You see, they were stepped out of their comfort zones. They got out of themselves. They stepped beyond themselves, and now they saw results. But had they said, Jesus, I got the power. I understand. Wherever you go, I go. Who you serve, I serve. What you eat, I eat. I got that. But you want me to go without an itinerary, without a plan, without, without money, without a business plan, without a house, without rent for the car? You want me to do all these things? And you expect me to say yes? And God says, yeah. Yeah. Because I'll care for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. And they come back, and Jesus says, hey, hey, hey. Don't be so excited that the demons are subject to, to my name. Don't be so excited that you can't. Be excited that your names are recorded in heaven's register. 
Be excited that you have got it. Be excited that something is going on, that you have a reason to live. So they experience life with fulfillment, life with purpose. You and I have got to learn to rely on God's provision. God's provision. Now, am I telling you that you got to go sell your car, sell your, uh, sell your home, sell your clothes? I'm t- am I, is, you, say, you walk out of this place saying, well, Pastor Luke said that I got to get rid of everything. I got a, I got a backpack or I got a duffel bag. I can fit a shirt, a pair of undies, and a pants, and maybe two pairs of socks because I don't have that much faith. No. What I am saying is that when God gives you direction, when God, see, Jesus gave them specific instructions. Don't take this, don't take this, don't take this, don't take this. When God gives you specific direction, specific instruction, God will provide your entire need. God will provide your entire need. Think about it like this. Remember Abraham and Isaac? Do you remember Abraham and Isaac? Do you remember that God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, I want you to sacrifice, offer him to me? Abraham, the Bible says he rose early in the morning. Isaac's, Isaac's a pretty witty kid. You know, my, my son's three years old. It's amazing how smart he is. Mom and I, we, we, try to, we try to get one over on him. We try to talk, you know, parent talk, and he catches on to it now. And it's like, uh-oh, you know, the, we gotta, you know, we're in that spelling thing, you know. Babe, where did the C-A-N-D-Y go? I'm H-U-N-G-R-Y, you know, H-U-N-G-R-Y. If I don't even know how to spell. <laughs> Ebonics. But God says... Abraham, Isaac's witty, he says, Dad, we're going, I get it, but there's, there's, there's no offering, there's, there's, no, there's no ram, what, what are we going to do? And Abraham says, God will provide. See, God gave Abraham specific directions. He said, Abraham, I want your son, I want you to go build an altar. So Abraham did, followed God's specific directions, ready to go. The, you know the story, the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, stop! And there, Abraham stops, and there he sees, God says, you've been faithful. And Abraham lifts his eyes, and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. Now, does that just happen? Does, does, a, does a ram, does a, does a deer, does a goat, does a wild animal just get stuck in a bush and you don't notice? Have, has anybody ever been in the wild? You ever seen a deer? I mean, when you see, uh, we, we went to Yosemite one time, man. It was beautiful. There were deer everywhere. Let me tell you something. I knew where all the deer were because we don't see deer, all right? And it's like, there's a deer. So how does Abraham walk past, miss this, this ram, you know, fight? No, God provided what happens in life when we say, well, God, you know, I'm, I'm following the direction of God, and, and I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. I'm alone. God, God's there. He's abandoned me. He's left me. Let, me. let me present a thought to you, a question, because we're talking about relying on God's provision. The question is, here's God. Here's the Word of God that proves God's faithfulness over and over and over and again, over and again through the Word of God. Here is God who has provided for each and every person that he's given them direction. And now you are saying that you, or myself, I've been there myself the same, God is not there for me. I am the one exception to the rule. Who is more likely to be the one in error? Think about that for a moment. What it boils down to is where do we miss? We take God's direction and we make it our own. Jesus told the disciples, now it doesn't say the disciples were they were nervous so they went on hotel and hotels.com and booked a hotel. Didn't say that they deviated or that they did things their way. You and I have got to learn that when God gives us direction, that we follow it the way God wants, not the way we want. Because that is when God's provision comes through. Are you with me today? Are you with me? All right, all right, okay. Now we're talking about life outside the comfort zone. Number two, number two, this is a really neat one. The opportune moment is always now. The opportune moment is always now. And I've been there in my own life. I say this all the time. Man, babe, when we turn, when we turn 35 or when, we, when we're 50, we're going to be here. We're going to do that. And this is going to happen. This is our five-year plan. This is our 10-year plan. You know, when, when, I, when I get to this point and when I get to that point in my life, then I'll do this. And God's saying to you and I, it's not about your five-year plan. It's not about your 10-year plan. When it comes to the things of God, when it comes to stepping out of our comfort zone, God, when when I've been a Christian for five years, I'll start witnessing. God, when when, when I see that somebody is willing and I know for a fact that there's no risk in sharing the gospel, I'll share it. But God says, it's not about when you're ready. The opportune moment is always right now. There is no time like the present, right? Right? 
The opportune moment is always right now. If you've got your Bibles, go to me to the book of John. John in the fourth chapter. I was reading this this morning, and, and I tell you what, the, the Spirit of God was just all over me on this. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. John in the fourth chapter. Samaritan woman at the well, you know the story. Jesus calls her out. You haven't had one husband. You've had five. The man you're with isn't your husband right now. I perceive that you're a prophet. Yeah, I just read your mail. So she goes and runs and she tells the whole town, there's a prophet, the Messiah, he's the one that he claims, you got to come here, this guy, he read my mail, he, he, he displayed it for me to see. So they say, well, let's go check this guy. So as Samaria, this, this village in Samaria, Samaria is coming to see Jesus, the disciples find him. And they, they realize, Jesus, you, you've been out and about, you've been doing your thing, you, you need to take a break, Jesus. You need to eat. You need to stop, let's, let's, let's get some fish and let's get some loaves, you know, let's eat that. And Jesus says... My, my, my food is to do the will of God. Verse number 35 of the fourth chapter, verse number 35, Jesus says to his disciples, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Just imagine here now. This is agrarian culture, so they're out there. They're farmers. They're, 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 they're planting. They're, so they're looking out at the fields. There's, there's no fruit. There's no harvest time. There's, there's, there's no yield of crop yet. It's still in the ground. It's still springing. Four months. That's a significant amount of growing time. And so Jesus uses that as an example. He says, don't you say by looking at this that the harvest is four months away? Okay, Jesus. Yeah, sure. I say to you, Jesus says, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest, Jesus says. They are already white, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. The disciples are like, Jesus, you know what happened? Jesus just blew their minds. Because he was talking to them for a moment about the physical. They were on the same page. And then all of a sudden, he turned it around. I'm not talking about the harvest of corn. I'm not talking about the harvest of wheat. So I'm talking about the harvest of men. Look up right now. The harvest is plenty. It's white. It's ripe for the taking. People have sown. I, Jesus says, I have sown. I planted the seed. The woman in Samaria is going out there propagating the seed right now. And now it's time for you and I to get together and to sow, to reap the harvest because it is plentiful for you and I. There is no opportune moment right then, right now. We can't say, let's do it tomorrow. Let's go this week when we get here with God. God. It doesn't matter how much or how little you know about Jesus Christ. There is no opportune moment except for right now. This is the time that we have. Let's not waste it with wishful thinking. I remember I was camping with my friends, uh, my brother-in-law and some of his friends, really. Uh, and I was just the guy along, you know, I like camping, I like fishing. They said, come on, let's go. There's a bunch of guys hanging out. I'm the one Christian of the group. Everybody else is sitting around the campfire and they're drinking their, their whiskey and their, their booze. And, you know, I'm just out of the element. I, it's just, this is not me. I don't drink, never did, never wanted to, never, just no thank you. You know, and, and, and so they're sitting around. They're kind of, they're doing their thing. And they start getting a little tipsy as the night goes on. I'm sitting around the fire. I'm just praying under my breath. Just, all right, God, let the night pass. Let's get on to the next day. And a guy, one of my brother's friends, starts asking me, hey, you're, you're a pastor, right? Now, just imagine, he's, he's kind of, you know, <laughs> you're a pastor, right? Mm. So we start talking. The, whole, the Lord says to me, hey, ask him, ask him where he's going when he dies. Hey, man, what, what, what's the deal? What, what happens if you don't wake up tomorrow? So we start talking about it. And basically, I start just reciting what we, what we know as the altar call. You know, you, you can't go to heaven. Because he, this, this guy was amazing. was such an eye-opener. This guy, we were having this conversation. Well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Where does it say that you can? Oh, I don't know. Oh. My parents told me I was a Christian. Where does it say in the Bible? Oh. Well, I'm like, go to church on Christmas and Easter. Where does it say? Oh. So I go and I start talking to him. I said, well, do you want to receive Jesus? No, nah, man, I'm all right. I'm all right. Cool. Okay. All right. I got to get a text from that guy about two months later. He says, Luke, 
just want to say thank you. Because you said some things to me around that campfire. And it stayed with me. It says, I went to a church locally here in Riverside where he lived. I said, I went to a church. And the moment I walked in that door, I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying. And he says, Luke, I just want you to know that because of what you said to me at that fire, I walked the aisles of that church and I got saved. And I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I thought, whoa, ah! I could have been like, dude, you're drunk. Your breath stinks. I'm going to go lay in my tent. They all had one big tent, the drunk tent. I had my one small tent, the Christian tent, me and God. But the Holy Spirit said, just share. And like Jesus said, that pastor of that church reaped a harvest of a seed that he did not plant. Because the opportune moment was taken. And God said, share my love. And the seed was planted and God brought him to a place where he now knows Jesus Christ. You never know what the moment will hold. But we have got to learn to step out of our comfort zone. If I would have stayed in my comfort zone, nothing would have happened. That man's life could have been on my hands. When I, when I stand before God and God says, I gave you the opportunity. Why didn't you take it? Wow, we've got a purpose in life, a reason, a calling in life to live. Are you with me today? So we're talking about stepping out of our comfort zone, life outside the comfort zone. We've got to understand this. Prayer, number three, prayer brings supernatural power. Prayer brings supernatural power. Now listen, 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 listen. Prayer is not recommended. Jesus says, well, if you so feel like it, pray to God. If you think... It would help make your requests known to God. It might help to go before God. With, he doesn't say that. When you pray, he says, make your requests known to God. Go before God with thanksgiving. You see, prayer is not recommended. It's mandated. Jesus tells his disciples, he says, hey, stand and watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. Jesus was in deep and intense prayer before God and his disciples couldn't even stay awake. But you see, when we get into a powerful prayer life, God's power comes into us. There's a statement. We say prayer changes things. The travesties that are happening in Nigeria, that are happening in Indonesia and in these areas, that are happening around the world, what can we do? What can we do? We can't get on an airplane and fly over there and resolve their issues. But we can pray. And we must pray. We must believe God. And we must not pray little, oh, God, bless them, Lord, move, Jesus. The Bible doesn't say the wimpy prayers avail much. The prayers of the righteous, the fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. Why? God says, I want you to pray, and I want you to pray like you mean it. I got a friend right over there. He's wearing a blue shirt. His name's Rick. Rick, do you remember the time the, the, the switcher broke down? Rick's, man, Rick's a fireball, all right? I, I, I could talk about all night about that guy right there. But I remember I was in the control room. It was, it was a women's conference, or it was a Gino, one of those ones. And our switcher, the thing that controls the screens, the countdown is playing for the girls. I mean, they're getting all, ah, ready to go, right? And this thing, blue screen of death. All right, so we're like, all the girls run in. They got the headphones on. What's going on? What's going on? We got to start. We got to oh, work it. And we're pulling our heads off, or our hair out, just trying to figure out, right? So we're pushing all the buttons, trying to turn it on. Nothing's working. So me and, and, and our technical director, John, we're on there, and I'm crying. I'm literally in the control room crying. I've got this computer that runs this thing in parts on the ground, just laid out. Okay, this works, this works, this works. And I'm crying. And Rick's just back there pacing, just pray, pray, pray. And he, and he says, Luke, are you praying? Yeah, I'm praying. Luke, are you praying? Yeah, I'm praying. Pray out loud! Okay! <laughs> and so we began to pray. We, get, we began to believe. You know what? That thing came back on. And then we bought a new one. <laughs> if you got your Bibles, go to the book of Acts. Acts, the first chapter. Acts, chapter 1. We're talking about prayer. Prayer brings the supernatural power. Prayer brings the supernatural power. Acts, chapter 1, verse number 13. Acts, chapter 1. We're going to read a couple of verses, same thing. We're going to look down. We're going to skip a couple of verses, look down. We're going to read a story. We're going to read the cliff notes. All right? I'm going to give you the cliff notes version of the day of Pentecost. Acts, Acts chapter 1. 
Verse number 13, verse number 14, Jesus gives them instructions to tarry in Jerusalem. So it says, And they had entered. They went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, the Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Look what it says in verse number 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. It doesn't say these all continued to play PlayStation. These all continued to watch 30 minutes of preaching and 75 hours of sitcoms. These all continued, continued. You know what continue means? They kept doing it over and over, going, going, going. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women Mary and the, and the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now skip down a couple pages or a couple uh, lines down to Acts, the second chapter. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit fell upon them like a mighty rushing wind. People were walking around Jerusalem. It was a time when everybody was, uh, was pilgrimaging to Jerusalem, so there's people all over the place, and they heard this great rushing wind. You know, have you ever heard like a, a fighter jet take over? I mean, have you ever heard one of those suckers take off over your heads or just fly over and you're looking at, where's it at, where's it at? And it's like 10 miles that way, but it's just this rushing so they hear this and they say, what is that? And, they, and the Holy Spirit brings them together as they're inquisitive of what the sound was. And all of a sudden, the disciples speak out in verse number 14 of the second chapter. But Peter, but Peter, but Peter, but Peter, Peter. Well, you're not getting it. Peter, who? Peter. Peter's a dude that stuck his foot in his mouth over and over and over again. Peter's the guy that denied Jesus when they asked him as he was being convicted. This is the man that committed the failure of the disciples, minus Judas, who committed the ultimate. Not John, the one whom Jesus loved. Not Matthew, the, the forgiven tax collector. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And he begins to preach to them the sermon of Jesus Christ out of the prophecies, out of the Old Testament. And they begin to hear this and they're drawing closer and people are pressing in. Verse number 40 goes on to say, all the way down to verse number 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Verse number 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And in that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls. Now look around the sanctuary. Just look from left to right. Look to the back. You can turn around. There are 2,658 chairs in this auditorium. If I was to turn this microphone off, it would be difficult for me to project to the back rows. And that is the number plus 300 more that came to know Jesus Christ. This was not a time of amphitheaters, of great speaker systems. It wasn't a time of harvest crusades. Well, let's get a band so everybody can come together and, 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 and in the guise of, of music, we'll give them the gospel. They taught the word of God because the power of the Holy Spirit was upon them. Because prayer brings supernatural power. Here's the problem. We want 10 days of power for 10 minutes of prayer. God, give me the power. Praise God. That's it. But it says that they were in that upper room for 10 days in prayer and supplication. So they were in prayer for 10 days, and they had 10 hours of power. And in that 10 hours of power, they changed the world for Jesus Christ. The gospel went out. And in one day, 3,000 people were added to the kingdom of God. So we've got to understand, church, it's not about these 10 minute, 10, 10 minute little quick prayers. It's not, you know, the exercise programs on, on late night TV. They go from, from 90 minutes to 60 minutes, from 20 minutes to 10 minutes. Now you can get buff in six weeks on three minutes of exercise. <laughs> we want power from 10 minutes of prayer when God says, I want continual. I want prayer without ceasing. 
We say, I want, to, I want open lines of communication nonstop with you. And in doing so, with a fervent prayer, with an effective prayer, now all of a sudden we see supernatural change. So now we can see things like Nigeria. Now we can see countries that are falling away from Jesus Christ. Now we can see the strongholds of the devil being pushed back because the effective, fervent prayers of the righteous avail much, which means us, the church, gets on our knees, goes before God again and again and again and again and again, and we say, devil, you won't have have any ground devil you've got no authority devil in the name of Jesus devil you get out of here you get out of there in the name of Jesus and now we begin to see supernatural things happen in the kingdom of God because prayer brings supernatural power last one for today talking about life outside of the comfort zone number four preach to all that will hear preach to all that will hear or or, or is it preach to only those that will listen. You see, if we stay in our comfort zone, then we share the gospel with family, with close friend, with that person that we know, well, let me just talk to you for a moment. And even then, it's, it's hard. But what about those we don't know? What about those that we don't don't know anything about them. What about those that, that walk by us? Or well, what about those that sit next to us? Or what about those that, that, that carpool? Whatever, whatever it might be. What about those people? What about the people that need to hear the gospel? Preach to all that will hear. I was looking at a story today about a, a couple of guys, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and some other guys. And they went and they were looking for a tribe deep in the Amazon jungle, and they flew their plane, they found them, they located them after, after months and months of searching for this uh, amazingly uh, remote tribe. They went out there and they went to share the gospel. Their heart's desire was to share the gospel, and there they were martyred for their faith. They were martyred, they were killed by these men. And so you would think, you would think the families of these fallen missionaries would say, Psh, I'm out of this country. I'm out of this jungle. I'm going back to my mom and dad where my safety zone is. I'm going back to my family. I'm going back to my comfort area because my husband just died and I'm in Ecuador by myself. But rather, they go, the wives, the children, they go to the tribes, to the men that murdered their husband, to the men that murdered their fathers, and they share the love of Jesus Christ. The story goes on, if you've ever heard about uh, Steve Saint's book, uh, Beyond the Gates of Splendor, or his movie, uh, the, the Tip of the Spear, you see that they end up adopting each other. The man that killed his father, he is adopted by that man, and he begins to call that same man his grandpa because the love of Jesus Christ changed that village. But they had to go out of their comfort zone beyond what they were familiar with in order to change that people for the name of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, their lives were fulfilled, and those people's lives now know Jesus. We have got to preach to all who will hear. The Bible tells us in Acts, the 20th chapter. Acts, the 20th chapter. There's a man by the name of Cornelius. The Bible tells us he's a Roman centurion, which means in our day and age he's like a Roman lieutenant or a lieutenant in the army. And an angel comes to him and says, Cornelius, I want you. The Bible says he was fasting and praying. He was, he was, he was seeking God, and an angel of God comes to him and says, I want you to send for Peter. He's in, he's in Joppa. Send your messengers. Tell him to come to you. So Cornelius obeys. He sends a messenger. He says, all right, go find this guy, Peter, and tell him he needs to come speak to us. So his messengers go out. While his messengers are on the road, Peter is there, and God begins to speak to him. And Peter goes up on the roof to pray, and as he's praying, the Bible says he became hungry. And the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he, and he came into a trance. He came into a vision. He was, he was there, ca caught away. And there he saw a vision of, of four-legged animals, the Bible describes in Acts 20th chapter, coming down. Things that the Jews in their culture would say are unclean. Things that the law said, don't eat, don't touch. And God says to Peter, Peter, eat it. Peter says, no way, that's dirty, I ain't going to do it. And God says, don't you dare call unclean what I have said clean. And the Bible says in Peter's vision, that happens three times, and then it's gone. And Peter's back, back in the, whoa, what just happened? Then all of a sudden, by coincidence, I don't think so, but then all of a sudden, some Roman centurion's messengers say, are you Peter? Yeah. 
We need you to come. We need you to come, man. We need you to come. Cornelius, my master, needs you to come and speak to him right now. Huh. Gentile, Roman, mm, dirty, unclean. Oh, God said don't call unclean what I said clean. So Peter goes and he begins to preach the word of God to Cornelius, to a Roman, to a heathen, so he would see. The Bible says in Acts 20, chapter, verse number 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, the Jews who believed, were astonished. As many came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. You see, to a Jew in his society, Jews had high disdain, had a great disdain for certain groups of people. Number one, they had a disdain for proselytes. Proselytes were people that would follow the rules, but were not of Jewish descent. In the synagogues, they were shaped like an L. The Jews sat on one side, the, the, the proselytes sat on the other side, and the rabbi would speak the word of God. And the Jews were not able to see the proselytes or the Greeks because they did not want to be connected to them. They did not like them. Secondly, Cornelius was a Roman. The Jews had great disdain for Rome because they represented the occupying force that took their promised land from them. Third, Cornelius was a centurion, which not only means that he represented Rome, he was the very occupying force that the Jews opposed. So in every form and fashion, Cornelius and Peter were on two separate playing fields. But because God spoke to Peter and God said to Peter, Peter, I am going to rip you out of your comfort zone. And I'm going to take you to a place that you cannot stand, to a thing that you would call unclean. I'm going to let you speak. And as you do, the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles. And now Peter, a Jew who could not do this before, because Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, he said, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the Jews. But now God changes and he says, Peter, now you're out of your comfort zone. I want you to talk to the Gentiles. And because of that, the Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and his family and his household. And everybody who's a Jew says, oh my gosh, God moved on Gentiles because they were taken out of their comfort zone. We've got to preach to all who will hear. Not just those who we love, not just those who we know. To anybody that will listen. Share the word of God. Share the word of God. Whatever we do, share the word of God. Colossians in the third chapter. It's not on the overhead. I'll read it to you in the New Living Translation. We'll finish on this. Colossians in the third chapter. Verse number 16. says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness... Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom that he, Jesus, gives. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever we do, whatever we say, we are representatives of Jesus Christ. Now, church, we have a choice. As Christians, as family members, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a choice to stay in our comfort zone, to stay in our personal space and say, well, this is my life, this is my little circle, I like my stuff, I'll hold on to it, or we can say, God, I want you to invade my space. God, I want you to invade my life. Remove my comfort zone from me. Let me get out into the open world and let me share your gospel in everything that I do so that more would come to know who you are. A life of monotony or a life of adventure. It's not about vacations. It's not about exotic locations. It's about seeking after God and following God and trusting that God's provision will cover us. It's about trusting in God. It's, it's about teaching those who will listen. It's about reaching those. It's about prayer. Number one, relying on God's provision. Number two, realizing that the opportune moment is always now. Number three, realizing that prayer brings supernatural power. And last, to preach to all who hear. All who will hear. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Please don't get up. Please don't leave. Just give me a just quick moment more of your attention. There are those of you in this place that you, need, you know where you're at. You know you need to examine your heart. You know you need to check yourself in your relationship with God. Ultimately, as I was driving to work today, I saw a head-on collision that had just happened. The ambulance and the fire department were there. 
You don't know what life holds, what tomorrow holds on to. You don't know if tomorrow is going to come. So let me ask you, if you were to leave this place and you were to die, examine your life. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Well, what's your answer? What makes you think you're going to get to heaven? You say, well, I think so, I hope so, I want to. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can think, hope, or want your way into heaven? Well, but my, past, pa, pa, my parents told me that I was a Christian. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. I'm here tonight. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you're a Christian? Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you got a cross around your neck? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you call yourself a Christian because you've given yourself the title? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you got a Jesus tattoo or you wear Christian clothing, you got a sticker on your car that says Jesus or I believe in God that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. Well, you say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that good people go to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Here's the reason why. Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get into God's heaven is God's way. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one, listen to this, no one goes to the Father except through him. You can't get there your way, my way some well-meaning church committee's way or anything like that, the only way you and I can find ourselves with God in heaven is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives instructions to a man. John, the third chapter, speaking to a religious leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a man who gave to the poor, a man who taught the scripture in the synagogue, a man that, that did all the right things, wore all the right things, said all the right things. This is a man that you and I would look at and say, this is a good man, a righteous man, a holy man. And Jesus says to this man, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, in order to, to receive eternal life, you must be born again. Now our culture, our society, Hollywood, they've made a mockery out of it. They think of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. You think, oh man, that's those, those guys over there, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going there. I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I can't do that. But let me tell you something. I don't care what society's made it out to be. They have no concept of God. The reality is, is that born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing in God's eyes. You ready for it? Here it is. Simply means this, that you've given God all your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not about you. Listen, 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 listen. It's not about your mental ascent of who God is. I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here. But I don't want to give you the opportunity or not give you the opportunity to ensure. You see, we can't miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance between our head to our heart. Because God says, I want all of your heart. I want all of your life. It's all. All or nothing relationship. Let me prove it to you. First of all, the Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe that Jesus is the Son of God, yet they're not on, the, not on their way to heaven. It's more than that. It's an all or nothing relationship. And Jesus... Jesus speaking to the church, to the church, to the believers. In the book of Revelation, he says, listen, I know your works. I know your deeds. I know your life. I, when I come back, Jesus says, I'm coming back. And when I come back, Jesus says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. He goes on to say, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that you'll be treated as waste, as rejection. Lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. We're rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's talk about that. Let's define that so we can be clear. Think of it like this. You know, a warm soda on a hot day doesn't do the job. Jesus says lukewarm. You're a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing your thing, some of God's thing, doing some of your own things. We say it like this in our day. You're riding the fence. Not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. You're kind of right there in the middle. First of all, uncomfortable position to be in. But Jesus says lukewarm Christians are not going to make it into the kingdom of God. Think about it like this. In any relationship you were to ever experience, whether it be marriage, whether it be friendship, whether it be business, with children, whatever it might be, if you were to come to that person and you were to say, I'm only going to love you two days a week. The rest of the time I'm going to do my own thing. And expect that relationship to succeed, to grow, to blossom, to flourish. You know full well that it would never succeed. Yet we think that we can give God one or two days of our week, five or ten minutes of our day, and think that that's all that God desires. When God's saying, I want all. I want an all-or-nothing relationship. I want you to believe with all of your heart. I want to see all of your life. And in return, he says, I'll give you life. Abundant life. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't think, hey, well, Pastor Luke, you know what, man? I, I, I'm on my way. I know where I'm going. There's nothing I can do about it. I'll, I'll just experience it while I'm there. Let me tell you something. There's no parties in hell. There's no exits. It's not going to be a, a celebration. The Bible says it's a place of weeping or gnashing of teeth. And sometimes we say, well, it's hard to believe that God would send me to hell. It's hard to believe in a God that, when you say a God that loves me, when he'll send people to hell. Listen, let me tell you something. The Bible says that God so loved the world, he gave Jesus. It goes on to say, not to condemn, but to redeem, so that they might be saved. You see, God's given you everything you need in order to inherit eternal life in paradise with heaven. 
by accepting the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Not your way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way. You're not going to come back as a frog, a log, or a dog, or anything like that. This is your one shot. The Bible says our life is a vapor. So let me give you that opportunity. In just a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible real loud like that. Bang! And when I do, I want to ask you to be bold. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Here's what I do. I want to smack my hand on my Bible. I want to give you the opportunity. What I want you to do is I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising your hand and saying, Pastor Luke, hey, today I, I, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I, I want to make sure today, I, I want to ensure my place with God in heaven forever, leaving hell behind. You see, Jesus said, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And put it right back down. And what you're doing is you're saying, I, I want to take the first step. I want to go forward. You say, well, I don't think I could do that. People are going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. Listen, don't let a moment of irrational emotion stop you from making the very best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. This is a decision that will seal your eternity with God, leaving hell behind. This is not a moment of embarrassment. This is a moment of celebration. So don't let your mind, your conscience stop you or turn you away from this. This is your moment. This is your time. Who should raise their hand? If you've, given, you've never given them your heart, you've never given them your life, you've never made a commitment. Today, this is your day. Don't go any further. This is your moment. This is your time. Who should give? Who should raise your hand? Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this as a child or at a Harvest or Billy Graham crusade. You never really followed through with it, never really followed up with it, kind of been doing your own thing. If that's you in a moment, just pop your hand up. I'll see it. Take that first step. Who should do this? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, this is the moment, this is the time to stop in your tracks, to turn around and to give God your heart, give God your life, and ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever, leaving hell behind. It is your free will choice. Listen, God's not in there up in heaven waiting to whack you over the head with a two by four. He sent Jesus Christ to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross for your sin, for your shame, for my sin, for my shame together because of his great love for us so that we could receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. It is a gift for you and I to choose, but you have got to take the first step and act on it and accept it and receive it. Today, it's your decision. So all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, listen, if you're in the family rooms, back there in the family room, if that's you, I'm talking to you, and this is you in just a moment, get ready. I'm going to count to three. If you're listening or watching online, live, this is your moment. Wherever you're at, stop what you're doing. This is the time of your salvation. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait till tomorrow. There is no opportune moment like right now. This is the time of your salvation. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hand. I'll clap my hands on my Bible. And if that's you, I want you to pop your hand and be bold about it. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it and count it. Put it right back down. We'll go forward in your relationship with God together. We'll change destinies in just a moment together. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Get ready. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two. I see you right there. Three. I see you right there. Four. I got you right there. Four wise people. Anybody in this place today? Come on. Where are you at? Four wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Five, I see you back there. Anybody in this place today, you want to give them your heart, you want to give them your life? Oh, come on, I know that there's more than five of you. I see hands pointing over this direction. Six, I got you, my man. Where are you at? Anybody else in this place? Six wise people. Say, man, I want to give them my heart. I want to give them my life. Listen, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time. Listen, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's God speaking to you right now. This is your moment. Don't start it off with rejection. Don't start it off with disobedience and rebellion. God's speaking to you. Respond. Respond. Take the action. Come on, where are you at? Six wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Where are you at, number seven? Where are you at, number eight? Where are you at, number nine? Anybody else in this place today? I'm going to close it up. I'm going to close it up right now. Well, praise God for the six wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand. And Elijah's going to sing a song. We're going to sing it together. If you raise your hand, listen, if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you're saying in your heart right now, man, I missed it. You did it. You just take the first step. Now it's time to change destiny. So we're going to sing a song together. We're going to stand. Please, nobody leave at this time. If you raise your hand or you should have, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you brought somebody or somebody came with you, come with them. If you saw somebody, they came or they raised their hand, Go with them today. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me here at the aisle, and we're going to change destinies together. So come on, let's all stand. If that's you in this place, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies right here, right now together. This is your moment. Won't you come just as you are? Oh, and hear the Spirit call. This is your time. Come on.
I can't make you come. I can't force you, nor would I ever dream or desire to force you. But what I can tell you is the truth. That just because you raise your hand doesn't mean you're going to get saved. That's the first step. It's time now to make that confession. It's time now to give and surrender your heart, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if that's you in this place and you raise your hand, don't you dare start your first moments of your walk with God in rebellion and disobedience because you can't do this. We're here for you. We're rooting for you. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, come on. It's serious enough for me to, to wait to delay this for your sake. So we're going to sing that one more time. And if that's you in this place, if you didn't raise your hand or you did, but you're not here, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come, let's change destinies right now. This is your moment. Don't wait another moment. Come on. If that's you in this place. You guys came. It's a good day. It's a good day. Good choice, guys. Not going to a funeral? All right. You're going to a birthday celebration. It's your birthday. You're going to be born again, all right? It's a new day, the first day of the rest of your life today, right now. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. All right, Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you right over there. Hey, I promise nothing weird goes on. I am as weird as it gets, and you made it through me. Ask any of the pastors. I'm the weird one, okay? And you made it through me. All right, so nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Okay, we're going to do that together. He's going to give you some free literature. You're going to walk out of this place and say, what do I do? Well, we're going to point you in that right direction. The last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, make sure somebody's working with you so you know how to use that equipment that nobody has, nobody has any clue how to use. Spiritual personal is a friend. Somebody will meet with you. Get you a cup of coffee before church. Teach you some things about the Word of God for five weeks, 20 minutes or so. Sit down with you, personal one-on-one. -on -one. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from right now, but you go forward in what God has for you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.